thank you for having me here. It's very impressive. Um, so yes, today I will talk about uh, the robust reconstruction of chain expression profiles from reported fluorescence data using a linear framework. So that will be pretty different from the previous talks. And I'd like to thank uh, the people who collaborated on this. So my team's advisors, Delphine Ropers, Hans Geiselman, and Hide de Jong, the INRIA, and our colleague Michel Pache from the University of PM on this front. So our problem is as follows. Uh, we are considering a population of bacteria. So in our we work with E. coli. Um, and so this bar the bacteria are growing. And in this population, we focus on a particular gene of interest. Uh, in this example, you can see it's ACS. It's a gene coding for uh, an enzyme responsible for the digestion of acetate. Um, and so we're interested in how, the, how E. coli expresses this gene. And we're interested in two metrics in particular. The first metric is how often does E. coli transcribe this gene? So how many transcriptions do you have per minute? And this we call the promoter activity. And the promoter activity is actually modulated by the regulators of the gene ACS. So ACS has like three proteins that regulate it. And if we can, um, if we can measure in a very, very um, precise way the um, promoter activity of ACS, we will be able to make a regulation mode for this gene, uh, which will enable us to then predict the promoter activity of ACS in a bigger model involving more genes or in a, in a subsequent experiment. So the promoter activity and another metric that we're interested in uh, is protein concentration. So simply how many proteins of ACS is there in, in each cell? And so we, we make experiments which we perturbate um, E. coli and then we, are, we, we want to see exactly what the whole movie of the experiment. So at every time point, uh, what is the promoter activity of ACS and what is the concentration of protein? This is something that can be done using direct techniques. So you can western blood, for instance, to find protein concentrations. But you need to sample and you don't have a very nice time uh, resolution uh, and it's not very quantitative. So another way to get uh, these quantities, an indirect way is to use promoter genes and the, the reporter genes, sorry. And the idea of fluorescent reporter genes is that you construct a synthetic gene. So here is PACS GFP here. And this gene has the same promoter region of, as uh, ACS, so it will have the same promoter activity, but instead of coding for the ACS protein, it will code for a fluorescent protein, which we can very, very easily uh, uh, observe. So very simply how we do our experiments. Um, so we insert this reporter construct on the plasmid. The plasmid goes into E. coli. E. coli is grown overnight and on the morning we dilute it in fresh medium on a 96 uh, plate, 96 wells plate. So we can do 96 experiments at the same time. Uh, and E. coli grows and the plasmid uh, is conserved uh, between the generations. And we put the plate in a microplate reader and in microplate reader we can read two uh, signals. The first one, the green curve um, here, is the absorbance. So the absorbance basically gives you the volume of the population. So you can see the population grow and then stop growing when all the nutrients are exhausted. And then you have another curve which is the fluorescence, which is simply, gives you simply the number of fluorescence molecules inside uh, each well. So that's it. And, and the nice thing is that with this method, you can actually measure in each, each, in each well every two minutes. So you have a very, very nice time resolution and you can see exactly what things happen. And when you treat your data, you get this kind of curve. So here it's motor activities. It's an experiment where, we, where in the wells you have two carbon sources, glucose and glycerol. And when glucose is exhausted, the bacteria switch carbon source and go to glycerol. And you can see that there is a lot of very interesting things that happen in terms of promoter activity during this transition. And the goal is to really be able to uh, capture this promoter activity as precise as possible to be able to calibrate a model of transition, um, of genetic transition of the bacteria during, during these fast transitions. Um, yes. mm -hmm. So to, to the problem. Um, so we have a reporter gene and a reporter gene, its expression can be modeled in three steps. So you have trans transcription, translation, and then you have an additional step because actually the, the very young uh, reporter protein needs some time to mature before it can actually emit fluorescence. Um, so these three steps can be modeled as a differential equation model uh, with, in three steps. So for instance, if you look at the first line, the first line tells you that the total number of mRNA protein here uh, varies and the variation depends on the production of mRNA, which is simply the promoter activity times the volume of the population. And 
also you have a degradation of the mRNA. And the other step exactly the same. This is the reporter, it is produced, it is degraded, and this is the folded mature reporter, it is produced and it is degraded. And here we have a differential equation system with an input we are looking for, this is a promoter activity, and an output which is a total number of fluorescent protein which we can directly observe, this is the fluorescence in our, in our experiments. Okay, and there are several methods that have been proposed to uh, actually estimate the input from this model, but they all have different kind of inconvenience. For instance, one method consists in taking these two lines here and injecting them here and here. So it gives you an expression of A of T in function of R of T and it's derivative, but the problem is that R of T is noisy. So when you take the derivative, it poses problems. So you need to go through splines and so on. It's kind of complicated and stable. So the method we propose here, actual method that rely on the fact that this model, uh, this model is, a, is a linear, is defined a linear dynamic system. And what it means is that all the variables of the model, the derivative depend on the other variables in a linear way. Okay, and as a consequence of this, when you have like this uh, differential equation model that's linear, uh, the consequence is that the input, so the promoter activity here and the initial condition, they define entirely the output in a linear way. Basically what this means is that if you double promoter activity and if you double the initial conditions, they will have double fluorescence. Okay, but it's more than this actually. It means that if you consider your signal here and you, you decompose your signal into a sequence of values, actually there is a linear transformation that can link the vector of values of your input, so our promoter activity, and map it to what you observe, uh, which is fluorescence. And so you will observe something that is in a linear way to what you want to estimate, and this is simply uh, a linear inversion problem. Mm. Yeah, now to the protein concentration estimation. It's not more, more complicated. So in my previous slide, I explained that, uh, that, that uh, the promoter activity of the reporter gene is linked linear way to the observed fluorescence. But actually, you have the same system for the original gene on the chromosome. Uh, and here, you have, you have, it has the same promoter activity. And this activity is linked in a linear way to the concentration of protein inside the bacterium. And so actually you have a, con you have a linear combination, linear, sorry, a linear relationship between A and, between the promoter activity and the protein concentration, between the promoter activity and the, uh, the fluorescence you observe. So it's possible, it's not trivial, it's possible to construct a relationship between um, the, the concentration of protein that you want to estimate and the fluorescence that you observe. And so we have taken two biological um, uh, problems and, and show that they were uh, linear, so now it's pretty much a solved problem in the sense that uh, it's simply uh, an input uh, which is transformed to give an output and what we, get, what we observe is a noise version of this output. So this can be estimated using, using a multivariate regression. Uh, the only problem is that in most cases you won't have enough data so it will be underdetermined and will have like an infinite number of solutions that fit exactly your data. So you need to do some kind of regularization and since we have uh, biological signals um, um, uh, uh, natural uh, regularization uh, is simply to consider that to enforce that there is some kind of continuity between the values of u. So u is a biological signal, so you expect the successive values of u to be um, near one another. So you put a penalty on the successive increases of the of the um, sorry uh, of the values of u. Okay, and so this gives you this nice uh, quadratic optimization problem, which can be uh, set in which can be uh, written in algebraic form. Uh, so the only complication here is that since we have a penalty on the successive increase of the signal, we need, um, we need a, a derivation matrix here and we need to be careful that some terms in the, in the derivation matrix will be very small, otherwise we'll get bias on the first values of u. But anyway, once we have this form, with, with this algebraic form, we have a nice and unique solution for our int signal. Okay, and from there, we can go further. For instance, we are dealing with biological signals. We can put constraints on U, for instance, to enforce that every signal will be positive. Uh, you can very easily choose um, the penalty that you, that you apply to the, to, the, to the successive increases using generalized cross-validation, which is a way which is both rigorous and very, very fast uh, to decide this parameter. And yes, and you can use different uh, regularization methods. For instance, if you have a gene that has very, very sharp uh, increases, you can use L1 regularization, which is more adapted uh, to this kind of problems. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, and so when you look at the results, so um, this, is, this is an in silico simulation of what would obtain uh, in a microplate reader. So here, suppose we have uh, an absorbance curve and, and a fluorescence curve, and this is really typical of what you, you obtain. And, and you see the problem we have most of the time is that here, the whole first phase, uh, the signal is buried in noise. 
Okay, and this is really the worst case scenario for methods that have been proposed so far, because when you try to split this kind of thing and so on, it works very, very poorly, because at some point you have to divide signals uh, with one another and so on. So basically, all methods that are based on spline and so on, they will just fail at this kind of, of, of problems, okay? And our method, because we actually fit our data not to a spline version, but directly to the original data, it kind of understands exactly when there is not much um, information, where the information is, and see our method is a red curve, okay? And it's much more uh, stable and, and, uh, and robust. Uh, so that's, that's for, for the growth rate, that's for the promoter activity, uh, and that's for the estimation of protein, so you see, Every time, basically, we have a method that is quite robust and won't be disturbing uh, the signal is burning in noise. Uh, okay, so that was just one experiment, but actually we can make a more complete uh, analysis of the method. So, so the idea I'd like to underline here is simply when you have a method to retrieve a signal and you want to know how good it is, it's good to test it on in silico data that is as close as possible as your biological data because there is some smoothing in the method, so it's, it's, uh, it's bound to be biased at some point. So it's good if, um, if you use exactly the kind of signal that, you, so that was on my first slide, you have this kind of extremely big, and what I'm just checking here is that the method is really good and non-biased uh, and can retrieve exactly uh, any kind, any form of signal, even though at the beginning the signal is completely buried into noise. Mm. Yes, so we have started using uh, the method routinely in our lab. So this is the kind of real data you obtain when you, when you make up, when you apply it in the microplate. So you obtain this data. The different curves on each will actually replicates. Okay, and then I use simply the inversion methods uh, to retrieve promoter activities here, protein concentrations here. And I didn't talk about it, but you can also retrieve a growth rate uh, with this method. Okay, and what you see is that just without any intervention, the method just auto tune and can really uh, first be stable when, when, when the signal is very noisy, and also very much, very, may very well capture uh, the very strong and uh, changes that can occur uh, when you have a phase change. So all are the same, basically bacteria growing on glucose and then on acetate, and you see they have very, very different profiles, and they are very differently uh, to the transition, but the method is always capable of, of, of getting each of this. Okay, uh, so all the methods are implemented as a Python package. We put everything on GitHub in the hope that it will be useful. Um, and for our biologists who don't want to script their data analysis, we also made uh, a platform, a web platform, where you can, in a user-friendly way, um, uh, treat your data, just select some wells and compute everything. It's pretty fast, and it generally won't let you down. So yes, so here you have the link, GitHub and, and, and the and the web platform. I think you need you need to log in and to and, and yeah and to ask for a mod pass for a, for a password. Sorry. As a conclusion, uh, we provided methods for the reconstruction of promoter activity and protein concentrations. The nice thing is that is are robust and no hand tuning required, and that's I think a huge improvement on what was done so far. Um, what I presented here is really a, a very, very general method. You could complete the model as, as much as you want. You could say, what if degradation rates of my different proteins are not constant in time or things like this. As long as your model uh, stays linear, you can still apply these methods and they are as simple uh, to apply. So if you ever have uh, dynamic signals to, to estimate, uh, ju just, just see if you can uh, actually present your problem in, in a linear form. And yes, so please go check our code on GitHub. Uh, start it, follow, this kind of things. Thank you very much. There any question? Yeah, please. Very nice talk. I think you convinced uh, that method is working. What have you learned about the promoters themselves with that method, about transcription itself? Huh. Um, so, so this is actually a side project of my, of my thesis, and so the goal of my thesis um, is actually, pom, 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 pom. yeah, to study what exactly happens here. So here you have you have several you have several genes. Some are potentially regulator of the next one, and the idea is to really try to. Um, it's to it's to try to, to 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 see exactly if all the regulators can actually explain the promoter activities that you observe for the genes they regulate. I don't know if it was sense of your question. Um, yes, yeah, sort of. Okay, and another thing also, like, like the more you use them, it's that they work. Okay, so one one thing about uh, report fluorescent reporter genes is there are systems in which you have a lot of bias. 
So you can have bias because the number of plasmid copies change. Some people object to it because actually some fluorescence can depend on the oxygenation there is in your in your in your, um, in, in your medium. Uh, but what I have with this kind of system is that they work perfectly, which means that I, I have measured a lot of different promoter activities at the same time, and in the end, everything computes, everything fits to the same model. And basically, I can follow with that the concentration of a regulator and show that the regulator regulates exactly and only one gene. And so all the signals are coherent. And so that's pretty nice, actually. So it's both very, very easy to do. It's very, um, uh, yeah, it's very practical. And as long as I can say, yeah, at least for mine, very, very unbiased. And yeah. OK. Question about your uh, regularization uh, method. So, do, do I understand this, this correctly? You, you have this uh, regulation or regularization uh, matrix L. I think it, it is in the yeah next slide. So, so am I understand the, this, this this correctly? So, so, so you have this uh, L, and uh, it is an ill-conditioned matrix. It is a ill-conditioned matrix? No, it's not. Uh, it's not. You have uh, everything on the diagonal. It's, it's a triangular matrix with all yeah. the terms on the diagonal non -null. And it's a square matrix. Right. Because of the, the epsilon there, epsilon is a small value. Yes, it doesn't need to be that small. It needs to be small enough to not wait on the, on the first value, yes. Right. But th then, then it makes it an ill-conditioned matrix, doesn't it? It's still invertible. It is in Merton, yeah, sure. but uh, with, a, with a very small determinant. Yes, that's true. So, so, so when you are inverting it, actually you are amplifying the, uh, the, the epsilon. True. So, so how, how dependent is, uh, are, are your results to, uh, to the value of epsilon there? Mm, not that much. I mean, uh, it's supposed to. I mean, I mean, general, yeah, generally, I, I can put epsilon in like in a very, very large range of of values, and it doesn't change much. Mm -hmm. The result. I mean, I always get the same the same determination for my lambda, and it doesn't change anything. All right. So, so, so you are then parameterizing to the Lagrange multiplier. There is, is that is that how you are compensating for that? Sorry. Can no. you? Can are are you are you adjusting the the value of lambda to to compensate for that? No, the value of lambda is selected by cross-validation. Okay, yeah, maybe we can discuss offline. Okay. Thanks. Uh, any more question? No, so thank, thanks again to the speaker.